From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Monday, May 11th. I'm Wayne Pratt. This year's session of the Missouri Legislature is entering its final week. Lawmakers took an extended break because of the pandemic, but returned a couple of weeks ago and passed a state budget. Other bills that could be discussed this week include a prescription drug monitoring program. Senate Majority Leader Caleb Rowden says he wants to limit time on the floor because of the outbreak. Illinois' governor is defending a statewide stay-at-home order and plans to slowly reopen the economy. J.B. Pritzker tells CNN state residents will have to change the way things are done until this virus is, quote, eradicated. Riders on Metro Transit are now required to wear face coverings. The mandatory order goes into effect today. Riders without coverings are not supposed to be allowed to travel on the system. The new regulation does not apply to children to and under or riders who have trouble breathing. A California congresswoman who is a Vashon High School graduate says her sister has died of coronavirus. Maxine Waters adds that her sister lived in the St. Louis area. She tells the website The Grio that a service will be held in St. Louis. Waters announced on the House floor last month that her sister was dying at an area hospital of COVID-19. Here are the numbers. In Missouri, there have been more than 9,800 COVID-19 cases. That's out of more than 115,000 tests. The state reports more than 480 deaths. Illinois officials report more than 77,000 positive results out of roughly 430,000 tests. There have been slightly more than 3,400 deaths. In just a few minutes, St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan reports on how some hospitals have developed new triage policies during the pandemic. As we mentioned, Missouri lawmakers are headed into their last week of this year's legislative session. St. Louis Public Radio's Jacqueline Driscoll reports leaders want to keep the next few days uneventful as they also deal with the pandemic. Big ticket items like online sales tax or controversial topics like gun law reform likely won't get much traction this year because there's just not enough time. Senate Majority Leader Caleb Rowden from Columbia says he's being mindful of what bills he calls because as health concerns over the coronavirus continue, he wants to limit time on the floor. Obviously, we've used the leverage of keeping people on the floor for long periods of time to help work our way through, you know, substantive tough issues. Rowden says he's planning to dot some I's and cross some T's, but wasn't specific to what legislation that might be. In Jefferson City, I'm Jacqueline Driscoll, St. Louis Public Radio. The Illinois Restaurant Association wants bars and eateries to be on the same timeline as salons and barbershops and be able to open in some parts of the state at the end of this month. But Governor J.B. Pritzker is defending his decision to wait until phase four of his five-step plan, which would move that eatery opening date to the end of June at the earliest. It's difficult to do. We have to watch all these other industries open and see what effect that has on all the numbers, um, you know, as we think about opening restaurants and bars. Pritzker says it's difficult for restaurants to institute social distancing rules. In a letter urging the governor to reconsider, the Illinois Restaurant Association promises members will provide personal protective equipment to staff, space out tables, and limit capacity. Catholic churches in St. Louis stopped offering many in-person services in March as a way to slow the spread of coronavirus, but local priests at one South County church have developed a new way to continue hearing confessions, a drive through window. Father George Staley of St. Francis of Assisi says it's a small way to help congregates feel connected to their parish during a challenging time. We put a trash bag on one window to keep it anonymous and plastic wrap on the other window to keep it, you know, again, with the germs that it would be both protective for ourselves as well as for the people coming in. He says dozens of worshipers have come to the confession drive through including some from Outside the parish, the Archdiocese of St. Louis says churches can begin reopening next week, but St. Francis of Assisi plans to continue offering drive through confession for congregants who do not feel comfortable going inside a church. In other news, some of the largest buildings in St. Louis will soon have to be more energy efficient. As St. Louis Public Radio's Chad Davis reports, The Board of Aldermen has passed an ordinance requiring owners to make changes to help eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. 
St. Louis is now the fourth city in the U.S. to pass a building energy performance standard. The legislation signed this week by Mayor Lida Krusen aims to help the city eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. It applies to buildings 50,000 square feet or larger. Catherine Werner is the city's sustainability director. She says larger buildings contribute to a large amount of the city's carbon pollution. That includes residential, commercial, and industrial, constitute nearly 80% of those greenhouse gas emissions. So by targeting those buildings, we're going to really see the most significant results. Building owners will be required to start meeting energy standards by May 2025. I'm Chad Davis, St. Louis Public Radio. The outbreak has forced hospital officials to think carefully about their triage plans. The policies help staff decide which patients to care for when resources are scarce, and that presents a moral dilemma. St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan spoke with St. Louis University bioethicist Jason Eberl about the ethical challenges of triaging COVID-19 patients. Historically, the notion of uh, triaging goes to battlefield medicine. It goes back to a physician during the Napoleonic era who was basically looking at who is most likely to benefit from treatment, who we can get back on the battlefield, and so on. Of course, we're not in battlefield conditions, but under crisis conditions where you have a surge of patients, all who need access to specific forms of care, perhaps using certain specialized types of equipment like uh, ventilators in the case of COVID-19, that's where the need comes in to determine who should be prioritized to get care. Speaking of ventilators, you were part of a team of bioethicists that surveyed dozens of hospitals in the U.S. about their ventilator triage policies. Basically, who gets a ventilator if there aren't enough for everybody? And you found that more than half of these hospitals did not have a formal policy at all about this. Was that surprising to you? So on on the one hand, it wasn't that surprising. Although I was more surprised by the lack of maybe state level policies, we've had other outbreaks like the the original SARS, uh, MERS, H1N1, and I was surprised more states hadn't developed policies in light of some of those past outbreaks. And honestly, I would say that, yeah, that's kind of an ethical failure on state health departments and hospitals to not have been better prepared. We've never seen anything like this pandemic. But we've seen other precursors that forewarned us that something like this would eventually happen. It's just a matter of when. Some hospitals have had to really quickly develop these triage policies in case they don't have enough resources and have to make you know, some really difficult decisions about which patients get treatment. What are some of the ethical issues that come into play when we talk about rationing care? One of the concerns would be, especially if it's not a completely blind process, might be whether certain forms of bias creep in, even inadvertently. Pretty much every policy we, we looked at explicitly excludes uh, discrimination based on socioeconomic status, race, gender, sexual identity, any, any of those things. But disability is a tough one because on the one hand, policies are very explicit about not discriminating against someone, say, for example, if they have Down syndrome. But there are other disabilities that may involve negative health conditions that may affect the likelihood of one's survival. And even putting aside disabilities, socioeconomic status, even though, again, there's no explicit bias against persons who are economically disadvantaged, being economically disadvantaged is correlated with higher rates of diseases like diabetes, coronary artery disease, and so on. So that might lead to their being in a poor health condition, which then if they get COVID-19 infection, may make them a deprioritized candidate for getting aid. This pandemic has exposed some vulnerabilities in our healthcare systems, and I'm wondering whether you think there will be any lasting changes in terms of how hospital officials think about biomedical ethics or plan for this kind of public health crisis. Yeah, I think to me the the more immediate ethical concern is the availability of, of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. So I think the the first long term lesson would be for yeah hospital administrators and also for government agencies and so on, things that fund our healthcare system, to really look at how we're allocating funds and making sure we're purchasing sufficient equipment and having it on hand and available. 
I think what's been exposed in our healthcare system and our society as a whole is really just where we choose to invest our financial resources as a country or as a healthcare institution or as a university or whatever. You know, what are we prioritizing? That was St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan speaking with St. Louis University bioethicist Jason Eberl. Our Maria Altman edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. From the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.